Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us to this side event to the CCPCJ, 33rd CCPCJ, on the use of social media and new technology in terror-related gender violence. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome you all, and I'm uh, inviting Ambassador David Roth, the permanent representative of Israel, please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, to my deputy Itai and Livnat for uh, organizing it from uh, the Israeli uh, mission, as well as to express my appreciation to the uh, German ambassador, Mr. Uh, Schmidt Breme, and Mr. Balzac, on behalf of Ambassador uh, Sramek from the uh, mission of uh, Germany and the mission of uh, Czechia. Uh, for their mission sponsorship of this event, as well as for uh, Vizzo, thank you very much, and UNODC, and I'd like to thank the, the panel panelists. We're so happy that you are here on this very, very uh, um, important matter that we are discussing here. Uh, we must acknowledge the profound impact that the misuse of, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry for uh, this, Anyway, I'm, I'm here speaking to you on, on, on this very, very uh, important issue. I would like the panelists to, to be the ones that are, uh, uh, are speaking, but I, I have to mention October 7th, where uh, Israel was attacked uh, was by, by Hamas. Uh, Israelis were butchered, were murdered, were, were burnt alive, were mutilated as well as sexually exploited, raped, and horrendous, horrendous things, which unfortunately some of them we will hear today. It is unbelievable uh, that this uh, went through. It is unbelievable that we do not hear enough about, uh, about this issue. I, every night before I go to sleep, at uh, 221 days, I think of the fate of the Israelis kidnapped that are still we have 132, many of them uh, dead, unfortunately, but hopefully many of them alive as well. We know from uh, the one that we did succeed to return of the torture that they are going through. We know of the usage of sexual uh, 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 rapes as well as, 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 as other means to our women there, to our men there. And, and I sit every night and I think before I go to sleep, how are they doing? What are they doing in those tunnels, suffocating? What torture, unimaginable torture that they are going through? And, and I think it is very important that we remember this, uh, this. It is unbelievable and it must not uh, stop. This requires enhanced cooperation by fostering collaboration among governments, civil society actors and technology stakeholders we can begin to dismantle the mechanism that enable terror-related gender-based violence to thrive. Together, let us harness our collective expertise and commitment to safeguarding the rights and dignity of all individuals. To those that think it can only happen to in Israel, it cannot happen to us, it cannot happen to other people. To those that would like to textualize this, say, well, contextualize this, well, we must understand that because Israel did this and that, we can allow this or we can excuse it. This will not work and whatever happens in our area can come to your area. And I hope we will be succeed to have a very professional uh, dialogue on this issue and how we can prevent it. How can we share information between our countries? There are many, many problems, technical problems of how, of, uh, of, of evidence which are located, for instance, in servers that are in country, other countries. How do we preserve the privacy of the people who were attacked while also learning? How do we cooperate? How do we exchange information? And I hope we will be able to do that today. Thank you very much. And I really hope I'm wearing this for our 132 people who are still in Hamas, in Gaza, as well as the Yellow Ribbon. They are in our hearts, and we, we hope they will be back soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I would like to invite Ambassador Schmidt Breme of Germany, please.
Ambassador, dear David Hood, colleagues, and all you who have joined in here in this important event, in this joint fight against sexual exploitation and the media scandalization of all this. First, I'd like to express our heartfelt condolences to the victims of the 7th of October and the ongoing torture. You see, among them are about a dozen Germans, but that doesn't, doesn't make the difference. It's human beings here. And those who did not have to experience these terrors in their families, I guess we cannot really imagine what they are going through. You see, after all those attacks, we hear a lot about and even from those who perpetrated it, who did the uh, hideous crimes. We know their names, but rarely we know about those who suffered it. Girls, boys, men, women, children, going around their daily life, commuting to work, attending a concert, being on their playground. Their names, their stories, at least for the media, uh, sink too fast into oblivion. You see, the terrorists, we have to raise our awareness against the gender and sexually based violence. And we have to stand up against the mediation of it. It's the way of the terrorists to humiliate them a second time. This cannot be accepted from our side. And even if the social media don't share the heinous objectives of the terrorists, their quest for clicks and for all for profit is shameful as well. And there we have to work together. That means we have to offer rehabilitation programs for the victims. We have to clamp down on the criminals, on the terrorists who did it. And we have to find a code of conduct for the social media not for uh, following their own egoistic uh, motives. There we have to find a way how to erase as soon as possible all those videos that humiliate and torture the victims for a second time. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador schmidt -Bremer. And uh, I would like to invite Mr. Yiri Blazek on behalf of Ambassador Samak of Czechia. Thank you. Distinguished Ambassador, uh, dear colleagues uh, and guests. Uh, my Ambassador would love to be here, uh, but as, uh, since he's the chair of the CCPCJ and he's chairing uh, the plenary meeting just next door, so uh, his duties uh, did not allow uh, to be present in person. So please let me convey his uh, uh, greetings and a message of support uh, for this uh, side event. Uh, Czechia is uh, pleased to co-sponsor this side event on such an emerging, uh, timely and uh, very relevant topic. Uh, addressing the issue of social media and new technology facilitated gender-based violence needs to be an integral part of the whole UN's approach to ending gender-based violence. This includes developing and adapting laws and policies uh, to prevent and respond to digital and technology facilitated gender-based violence and working uh, it and ensuring uh, accountability. Uh, in some countries like my own, uh, uh, the uh, fact that uh, some cr crime is uh, conducted in uh, uh, the, the uh, virtual uh, space uh, uh, does not mean that it uh, should be treated differently. It uh, automatically, uh, what is uh, a crime in the real life is crime also on internet. Uh, so some, uh, in some countries the, the, the laws the, uh, even don't need to be uh, adapted. Uh, uh, the intersection of terrorism, uh, gender-based violence, and technology is a very interesting and relevant angle to explore, and I look forward to inspiring discussions. In, in conclusion, let me recall that the Czech Republic was one of the first countries to strongly condemn the horrendous atrocities committed by Hamas terrorists in Israel on the 7th October last year. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Blazek. Mrs. Norbert Jill is an attorney, a Miss World, and an activist for women's rights. She has been advocating for action against sexual violence, including with various United Nations agencies, and, she, and she's here with us today to speak out for the victims of terror-related gender-based violence in all Belgium. Dear guests, my name is Linoa Vargil, and I was brutally raped when I was only 18 years old. This title was forced on me a few days before the title of Miss World was awarded to me. 25 years passed since, and my crowning event became a vague memory. But I lived the rape, and I experienced it every day, battling inner demons that tried to possess me to pull me back to the day I was abducted, brutally raped, and almost murdered. Since October 7, I feel these demons raise their head. The chilling testimonies, the horrific videos of the atrocities committed to my sister in Israel brought everything back. I feel their pain. I feel their insult, their dignity shattered, their lives taken and the petrifying, utterly disgraceful silence that we have witnessed ever since. I would like to share with you the testimony of Amit Susna, who was held hostage for 55 days. And he said, oh, come on, go take a shower. I told him, no, I don't want to. The water is cold. I don't want to take a shower. Please, I don't want to take a shower. And he said, no, no, don't worry. Don't worry. He untied me and took me to the kitchen and showed me a pot uh, sitting on the stove. And I remember thinking, I mean, now is the moment. Something, what you thought about is going to happen. I bent down in the bathtub like this, so I could like uh, cover myself up, taking the warm water from the pot and like put it in over my head. And for one second, I completely forgot about everything. I just really enjoyed the warm water on my face. And then I remember hearing him saying, um, quickly, Amit, quickly, quickly. And then I remember I turned around he was standing with his gun, and the gun was pointed out at me, and he was huffing and breathing heavily, and he had a face like a monster, like a beast, like this. So I stood up and held a blanket, a small blanket, to cover myself, and he came towards me and just uh, pointed the gun really hard at my forehead, screaming at me, take it off, take it off, and punching me until I could not uh, hold the... the the towel anymore and he started touching me and I resisted and then he dragged me to the bedroom and then he he forced me uh, to commit a sexual act on him um, and I remember the entire time I was like thinking Amit okay you knew it's gonna happen it's really happening. I said to myself, okay, you can handle this. You just want to survive. You need to survive. Your mom, your family is waiting. I just concentrated on that instead of what's really going on. And when he was finished, he went to clean himself up. I got dressed, covered myself up and I was crying. He came in and he told me, I'm good, Amit, right? I'm good? No, I'm no good. No, I'm good. I'm your friend, right? I remember I could not look at him. I looked away. And then he got really mad. He closed the door and I was in that room in complete darkness. Then he came in again and asked me, food, food? I'm good, right? I'm good, food? And I realized that if I say no, is gonna punish me again. So I said, yeah, food. I 
I'm standing here today because I can't keep silent to the ignorance of the world. It has reached unimaginable proportions, and we're witnessing the results every single day. The violent demonstration against innocent Jewish students in universities had crossed the red line and made it very clear that Israel stands alone. The absence and the lack of action from the presidents of these great and historic universities is an abomination. But what can we expect for when the UN Secretary General himself, Mr. Antonio Guterres, who has seen the report special advisor Patton issued regarding the conflict related sexual violence committed on October 7th? The report stating that there is clear and convincing information that sexual violence, including rape, occurred and may be ongoing against the hostages. Despite the report, he refuses to publicly announce and name the terrorist organization responsible of such atrocities. Secretary General Guterres claiming that Hamas terrorist attack on October 7 did not happen in a vacuum means that you are giving a hand and legitimizing the heinous acts. Among other crimes committed in Israel that day, you are legitimizing rape, legitimizing the butchering of women organs, legitimizing the agonizing screams of those who were violently murdered, and the pain of those who survived and witnessed. The link between sexual and gender-based violence and terror is not a new phenomenon. It has been documented in successive reports of the Secretary General in conflict related sexual violence. But somehow, when it was and is used by Hamas against Israeli women, it's not condemned as in other cases, but put in context. What context could there be in the use of women's body by terrorists? Why, what context can be given to committing sexual violence, including rape, sexual torture, and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment by those who storm to Israel with one aim, to annihilate the state of Israel? It's no longer about proof or evidence. This is absolute evil, evil towards the Jewish people. Pure anti-Semitism, a strong desire to destroy the existence, the existence of the land of Israel. The United Nations is supposed to be a beacon of place established to prevent atrocities and genocides across the world, such as October 7th, but instead, you sit silent when innocent women, babies, mothers being murdered? Can you sleep at night knowing that instead of fighting terror, you are legitimizing it? Only last week, we stood in memory of six million who were murdered in the Holocaust. And I'm sure that if the Nazi regime would stand here today, you would not condemn it because of your political interest. Shame on you, Mr. Guterres. The UN has no reason to exist as long as you are there. Shame on you. Where is humanity? Morality? I'm not a politician. I have no interest. I'm talking to you all as a mother of four kids, as a friend. Imagine yourself waking up in the morning in New York, Vienna, London, sleeping, waking up on Sunday morning, and what wakes you up in the morning is seeing your daughter bullily pulled out of a bed after being raped by multiple Hamas terrorists. Would you still stay silent? Would you still cover your eyes? The Hamas terrorist organization proudly documented the heinous acts that cannot be described. Naked women tied to trees, scattered bodies parts, born babies. 
and beheaded bodies are just a small part of a long list of torture. Many try to destroy an extreme NS as countless times throughout our history, and not one had succeeded. Everyone should know that we are the eternal people and Israel is here to stay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lino, for these very strong words and appropriate words. We will now go to our panel, and I would like to present our panelist, Dr. Nico Pucha, Department of Near Eastern Studies at the University of Vienna and co-founder of Human Cognition, Ulrich Garms, Crime Prevention and criminal justice officer at the terrorism prevention branch of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and Sharon Zagagi Pinchas, former chief military prosecutor of the IDF, member of the DINA 710 project, DINA means her justice in Hebrew, expert on criminal law, military law, and victims and crime victims' rights. Sharon Zagagi Pinchas, please. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and it's very difficult to speak after uh, uh, um, strong words from Lino and after we heard the testimony, sh a short passage from the testimony of Amit Susana uh, in the movie Screams Before Silence. Um, and my name is Sharon. Uh, I'm formerly the chief military prosecutor. I'm also a colonel in the reserve uh, forces of the uh, IDF, Israeli Defense Forces. And um, when October 7 occurred, I think we all felt like we were being thrown into this uh, strange and unbelievable uh, parallel universe where horrible atrocities that nobody even imagined that can happen, happened. And for me as a person, as a former, I served in the army for 25 years, I felt so helpless and so um, I didn't know what to do. And I felt a deep need to do, and um, to, 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 to do something to help. But when it happened, nobody needed a, a retired prosecutor from the army, and nobody even thought about the question of accountability when that happened. And, and during the days after, I started to, to get calls and to work sporadically um, to help in different directions. And then I found that there are other friends of mine. Uh, uh, other friends in uh, um, lawyers and um, uh, in experts uh, in law and in gender um, that were, were, were just circling in the same same circles, doing um, a lot of similar similar things, and we connected because at the beginning we were all in pins of needles, pins and needles just thinking and wanting to do something. And that's how uh, we established from sporadic uh, um, voluntary work uh, in different directions, uh, the DINA project, uh, which is called DINA is Her Justice in Hebrew, but it's also called uh, after the name uh, DINA, the biblical DINA from uh, the book of Genesis. DINA was the daughter of Jacob, uh, and she was abducted and raped. And it symbolizes our uh, fight um, that focuses on the um, GBV, on the gender-based violence, the conflict-related sexual, sexual violence that occurred uh, on October 7. And at the beginning, it started when we tried uh, to, um, like Ariadne from the mythology, trying to pull threads from all kinds of directions and put the pieces of the puzzle about um, what happened. Um, and today, there are some groups that do, that. Um, focused on documentation, and we also focus on documentation, but we focused our, another central of our aims um, is, the, is the subject of accountability, of looking ahead, looking not just at 
what's happening now, but what will happen in the future, and how we achieve accountability for all the perpetrators that hurt, that hurt and harmed uh, all those um, women, and also, also men and, and children um, and on October 7th. And the phenomena of gender-based violence or conflict-related rela sexual violence um, poses uh, a lot of challenges uh, in the field of accountability because the definition, all the characteristics of the f this phenomena are different from what we know in the domestic, uh, uh, domestic law and the domestic system. Um, the, the range of uh, actions that can be, can, that you can relate to them as GBV is much more broader than um, the actions that are in the law, uh, the definition of law. And if we just stick to the definition in the law, then we are missing a lot of the characteristics and a lot of the actions that really pose, they really are sexual-based violence. And it's not just rape and um, it can be other things like um, exposing a woman, like we heard Omitsusana in the video saying that she showered and someone looked at her. And it's not just forcing someone to do a sexual um, act unwillingly, it's also um, getting, hurting um, all sort of um, um, things that are connected to the female um, identity and the human identity. And if we do not um, deal with this characteristic, then we're missing out on the phenomena. And this is one of the first challenges uh, of gender-based violence. The other one, and we heard here uh, the testimony of Amit Susana, but Amit Susana is one of the very few uh, that gave or can give testimony about what happened. Because on October 7th, most of the, uh, of the victims died, didn't survive, and they cannot speak. And in order to together and figure out what happened to them, we have to um, use other measures and then the usual ones that we're doing in the domestic, um, domestic law, uh, like uh, forensic evidence, like footage. We know there are a lot, thousands of visual footage from October 7th, and there, there has to be um, a way uh, to really gather all of it and to uh, analyze it, maybe uh, an AI tool to analyze what happened uh, in order to gather evidence. And the other victims, those who didn't die, it will take them years to come <laughs> to cope with the trauma and then to realize that they can and they want to speak. And Amit Susana is very brave, but this is something that I think it will take time until we hear from live victims. And these challenges are part of uh, our uh, central aim. Um, mm -hmm. And another one is the question of attribution, because uh, um, what happened on October 7 um, differ from other um, occurrences of GBV. It happened uh, from a mass that invaded Israel, and in the power of, under the power of the mass, uh, those actions were made, were done, and it's very difficult to attribute which person did what. How can we attribute? which one of the perpetrators raped this woman, or which one um, tied the woman to the tree and, and shot her and shot her genitalia. And these are things that we know that happened um, on October 7th. But we believe we don't have to do it because when a mess invades in the power of the mess and the mess gives the other the power to do whatever they want, and some of them do the action, and some of them watch, and some of them gather and, and guard, then all of them are uh, responsible in the criminal, uh, uh, based on criminal theories that, that exist all, already exist around the world, all of them are responsible for everything that happened. So we don't have to pinpoint a certain person as the one that raped or shot or did something spe specifically. It is enough that he was there, and it is enough that he gave the power, when, when everyone enters under a certain plan, whether it was premeditated or spontaneous, then all of them uh, are responsible for everything that happened. 
also the murders, but also the um, sexual violence. Thank you very much, Sharon. Dr. Nico Pucha has a focus on analyzing and understanding the Salafi jihadist movement with the importance on writing and how these translate into the audiovisual output in the propaganda of Al Qaeda and Islamic State and how these materials are broadcast online by various means. Dr. Pucha, please. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation and um, touching a bit on what you said. We are going to take a dive into the social media aspect where the, the coherency that we see in jihadist, Sal Salafi jihadist networks, be it Al-Qaeda, be it uh, the Islamic State, and also to a limited extent, uh, be it Hamas, is that we find a high degree of coherency in the writings. So the writings are dominantly uh, authored, published, disseminated, distributed in Arabic, um, jihadi groups have a number of um, media outlets from where um, the content is being released. And of course, we also have a number of translator media groups dedicated to translating Arabic to German, English, Russian, whatever, you name it. It is basically there. So what's the connection? The connection is based on the content, as I mentioned, and I can't stress this enough. It's a highly coherent ideology that is based on theological principles and fundamentals that we see time and again in all the networks online, uh, even in investigation cases offline, sometimes more, sometimes less. less. The evidence-based findings are very clear that for jihadis and their mindset that is leading to motivation to acts, which then in turn is being uh, applied and documented in the uncountable uh, videos that we see online, uh, the textual layer is of the utmost importance and the bookshelves electronically or in paper matter gravely. So in a very short, brief nutshell, if you will, uh, what you see here on, on the screens is a network analysis from 10 years ago. It, princip by principle, it still works today as it did back then. Every dot is an account. The accounts are connected by speaking to one another, retweeting, resharing, or simply sharing the same content. And in the bigger networks, you see outliers, individuals who, for example, are bilingual, so they can project content from Arabic to German or to English or to any other language. And that echoes from a core network into a content-related, but not necessarily lingualistically kind of related network. The connection is clear, it's the content, it's the sharing, the approval uh, of what is being shared in the networks. Um, in Germany and in, in Austria, we had a few actors, German speaking, some of them Arabic speaking and other languages. Uh, some of these individuals became foreign fighters, popped up in the Islamic State environment years ago. Uh, and if you look at the network analysis from back then, it was quite clear and evident that German Arabic speakers were kind of um, hot stars within German language networks, where most people, most audience members in that network are not able to fluently speak or read Arabic, so they were re reliant on individuals explaining to them what the core meaning of this very specific mindset that we like to refer to as a theology of violence. Uh, but the same individuals within core Arab, Arabic speaking networks were quite unimportant. So this just shows you um, the power of language based on highly coherent content, as I mentioned. And very briefly, uh, as we see nowadays, I mean, it, I've been doing this work for about 20 years, persistent online presence, uh, yes, AQIS, Hamas to extend Taliban, not so much have been more or less driven from Telegram, uh, from Twitter, sorry, but are well established on Telegram. They have a number of other networks, platforms, Matrix, Rocket Chat, where they maintain their own servers. Um, basically, they are building their own you know, elements within the blockchain and the Web 3.0 elements, so it's getting even more difficult to, uh, you know, remove certain content, and unfortunately where we stand as of now is you would need a highly orchestrated kind of takedown on, across several platforms and networks in the Web 2 and the Web 3 environment to remove the content, and that is unfortunately quite unrealistic. 
So of the many elements in the text, and we're talking about 150,000 plus pages in Arabic, and again, the other languages, uh, we, find, we always find a certain number of course and themes, legitimations, explanations of who is a proper mujahid, who becomes a shaheed, a martyr, and so on and so forth. It's a very you know, never-ending type of topic. That's why uh, I like to stress the importance of reading the Arabic text, understanding it, contextualizing it, and decoding the video, the audiovisual output by knowing the text. And one element uh, that is quite frequent, but you know, not frequent, it's persistent, but not very frequent, uh, is the role of women. Women as wives of uh, Mujahideen, who then become the wives of martyrs, uh, quite importantly, mothers becoming teachers, facilitating the new generations of fighters. Uh, to a certain extent, they are the Mujahidat, as we see in the top right from a Al Jihad magazine publication from June 1985, or uh, as expressed by, uh, could you, ah, here we go, as expressed by uh, Al Qaeda leader Ayman Asawahiri's wife, uh, Umayma Hassan, uh, clearly outlining in a letter to Muslim sisters what their role should be as Muslim in the framework of jihad in the understanding of groups such as IQ and IS in particular. Uh, being short on time, um, very briefly, a lot of propaganda. So we have a lot of propaganda 24-7. Uh, IS alone published 15,000 videos and continues to do so. But what the propaganda, of course, does not tell is the violence committed against out-group elements. So uh, Sunni Muslims who are accused of, for example, blasphemy and are for this act executed, this kind of video material, uh, is seen time and again, but uh, not so visually expressed are non-Muslims who, by the same theology of violence, are kind of defined as, as enemies, be it because they are Christians as you know, fighters in Congo or, uh, or in other areas of the world. Um, that is where the propaganda is you know, taking a step back in what they are kind of processing to the target audience. Um, if you heard the uh, reports from the Taliban in Afghanistan where women are being abused by Taliban uh, members in prisons, of course, that's nothing the Taliban regime will talk about. However, if you know enough of their kind of ideology slash theology, it becomes quite clear that any non-Muslim is a very dedicated kind of enemy. Any Muslim accused of violating certain theological components such as women protesting in Kabul and being arrested for that are becoming outside, outgroup members and therefore violence is quickly exercised. The same is uh, true in the sentiment of the Hamas environment where uh, the, the question is Hamas content videos are being projected to the target audience in a very specific framing where violence is quite absent. However, uh, the presenting and the framing of the hostages, in particular of the handover of the hostages early on by Al Qassam fighters was put in a Sharia conform humanitarian kind of aspect. And what matters to them is the echoes within their target audience and audiences. So thank you very much and for the few minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Pucha. Uh, our last speaker is Ulrich Garms. He works at the Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, he's a crime preventer and criminal justice officer for the Terrorism Prevention Branch here at the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. He provides advice on requesting states on their counter-terrorism laws and policies and designs and delivers training and investigation and uh, prosecution of terrorism cases to investigators, prosecutors, and judges. Uh, Ulrich, please. Thank you, Itai. Excellencies, uh, the audience, uh, let me start by thanking the Permanent Mission of Israel for having organized this side event on a very important topic which the Terrorism Prevention Branch has been working on since 2016. In fact, much of what I'm going to say now can be found in UNODC's handbook on gender dimensions of criminal justice responses to terrorism. I've uh, brought some uh, copies and put them there in case you are interested in. 
You know, DC also has a program on technology and terrorism, but uh, I think that has been amply covered uh, by the previous speakers. I will not go there, but rather focus on the question of accountability for sexual and gender-based violence linked to terrorism. In a report published uh, some weeks ago only, the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate of the United Nations has concluded that criminal accountability for sexual and gender-based violence linked to terrorism remains elusive and often unattainable for many survivors. In my remarks, I want to focus, or to briefly address rather than focus, on three questions. Why is accountability for sexual and gender-based violence by terrorist groups important? What are the main obstacles to accountability for this type of violence? And what can be done to overcome those obstacles? For my presentation, I'm going to draw a lot on the work that UNODC has done together with the Department of Public Prosecutions in Nigeria. As the case of Nigeria illustrates, among others, why it is important to talk about accountability for SGBV linked to terrorism, and what are the obstacles and what can be done to overcome them. You all know that Boko Haram, the terrorist group waging a bloody insurgency against the government of Nigeria in northeast Nigeria, since uh, 2010 has uh, committed widespread acts of sexual and gender-based violence. You're all familiar probably with the abduction of 276 girls uh, <clears throat> from a school in Chibok, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. What we see in many countries it is that there is no or very few prosecutions of terrorism suspects for rape, forced marriage, or other related offenses. Even when the perpetrators are brought to justice, they are not brought to justice for committing acts of sexual and gender-based violence, but rather for offenses such as being a member of a terrorist group or supporting a terrorist group, uh, etc. That is to say, offenses which don't really re acknowledge the harm inflicted on the victims, but rather target uh, the membership in the terrorist group. Is that a problem? And if so, why? The argument could be made that what is important is to bring terrorists to justice and to secure that they are imprisoned. And if prosecutors operating with very limited resources find it easier to obtain convictions and prison sentences for offenses such as terrorist association, why should precious and limited resources be invested to prosecute offenses that may be more difficult to prove, such as that for rape, such as that the accused has raped or sexually exploited a woman or girl. Previous speakers have already mentioned some important reasons why it is nonetheless important to have accountability for, specifically for sexual and gender-based violence committed by terrorist groups. Let me just add one more. Particularly in contexts where girls and women are forced to become terrorist wives, such as the one in Nigeria, but also in Syria and uh, Iraq, the prosecution for sexual and gender-based violence offenses sends a very important message that these women and girls are victims and not somewhat suspicious accomplices of uh, the terrorist group. And this will be very important when the women and girls try to reintegrate into society. It's also important for them to access the medical, psychosocial and material support they are entitled to as victims of terrorism. So what are the obstacles? First, victims don't come forward because of the stigma that uh, attaches to being a victim of sexual and gender-based violence for them, for their families, for their communities. And this stigma and reluctance may be aggravated where there has not been only rape, but forced marriage or sexual enslavement over a long time when there has been a relationship in quotation marks and where there may be one or several children uh, born from that uh, coercive, uh, violent uh, relationship. On the law enforcement side, counterterrorism investigation and prosecution units are in many countries overwhelmed by the caseload and under great pressure to go for the offenses that are most easy to prove. Investigators and prosecutors are moreover often not trained to identify and investigate cases of sexual and gender-based violence, and I'm speaking about those who are specifically in the counterterrorism units. They are rather focused on prosecuting the offenses that are in the counter-terrorism law, and those generally don't include 
rape or sexual slavery or other such offenses. All these obstacles are present in the case of Nigeria, but they are not unsurmountable. In December 2023, the Federal High Court in Abuja for the first time convicted a Boko Haram member on charges of rape and forced marriage of two girls, sentencing him to 40 years, 40 years imprisonment. So what can be done to improve the prospects for, of accountability for sexual and gender-based violence linked to terrorism? I want to mention six measures very quickly. I promise. First, criminalize rape, forced marriage, or sexual enslavement as terrorism offenses where they are linked to terrorism, particularly if war crimes and crimes against humanity are not criminalized in that country's law. Second, encourage counterterrorism investigators and prosecutors to use offenses outside the counterterrorism legislation. Third, provide training on gender sensitivity to investigators, prosecutors, and judges dealing with terrorism cases. This will increase their awareness of sexual and gender-based violence in the counter-terrorism context and also their ability to interact with victims in a gender-sensitive way and thus avoid or reduce the risk of secondary victimization. Fourth, draw on expertise of law enforcement and judicial units that have specialization in dealing with sexual violence, such as in many countries, for example, units dealing with trafficking in persons. Fifth, outreach to survivors, their communities, women's organizations, and traditional leaders. Sixth, and last, train women's organizations and legal aid lawyers. In Nigeria, UNODC has provided training to the Legal Aid Council and regularly includes lawyers from the Nigerian chapter of International Association of Women Lawyers in the training. Let me conclude by stressing that accountability is important and good, but comprehensive victim-centered justice includes also medical and psychosocial support, compensation and other forms of reparations, truth-seeking, recognition, memorialization, and all of this, of course, with respect for privacy and the dignity of victims. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrich Gams. Uh, since you uh, ended with the steps forward or the things that need to be done, I will uh, give, and since we are just out of time, I will give uh, the, uh, to other uh, speakers, just if you can quickly give me one step that you think is, more imp is most important uh, to uh, combat and, uh, and work on prevention and uh, punitive uh, issues. Please, Nico, uh, if you can start. Really quickly. Uh, in regards of prevention, I mean, um, we have, do not conflate what jihadis produce with mainstream Islamic tradition and so on. We need to be very aware that our, the core target audience for jihadist material are uh, Sunni Muslims worldwide. And the, the most important language is Arabic. And we oftentimes, we bypass Arabic content generally because we don't have our eyes on it, we don't have an understanding on it. We don't seem to appreciate the depth of the, uh, the content that's being produced, the links from text to video. But it does matter uh, in terms of radicalization processes and as long as that is floating about freely online, which we cannot prevent, we should rethink prevention by taking maybe a step back, taking the content seriously and trying a different, more grassroots approach to it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think we talked uh, earlier about uh, the report of uh, Undersecretary Pramila Patton, and she worked on a limited mandate, and she came to Israel for two weeks, and it was in the beginning of, of January, and the end of December, and I think that there has to be a continuation of the inquiry, whether it's from the UN or whether from a civil society, because uh, now we, we have more and more evidence that is collected, and we can examine a further more uh, arenas than uh, the areas that uh, the limited mandate uh, was confined to. Thank you very much to our panelists. This is, uh, of course, just uh, a start of a discussion that must uh, occur in order for the international community to fight and prevent gender-based violence and in terrorism, of course. Um, I would like to thank our speakers. I would like to thank ambassadors uh, of Germany, uh, Czechia, and ambassador of Israel. I would like to thank the uh, technical team here and the CCPCJ uh, for allowing us to hold this side event. Thank you all for coming and uh, have a uh, 
good rest of the day and the conference. Thank you very much.